You know, I've already said Merry Christmas. The title of our series is Christmas. A little Jesus is more than enough. At my household, we say Merry Christmas, going back to the original meaning of the celebration of Christ. We say Merry Christmas. We celebrate Christ. You know, between the beginning of December and the beginning of January, we don't have enough digits on our hands to name all the different holiday events and situations, festivals that go on. But what I know is this, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord and we celebrate Christ. I just want to say this. A lot of people celebrate Christmas, but do they really celebrate Christ? Jesus is the reason for the season. Oh, boy. Have you ever felt inadequate? Have you ever felt that maybe you weren't good enough? That word enough is, can be devastating. I don't have enough. I'm not enough. It's a horrible feeling because not having enough or not being enough can be interpreted as failure. No one wants to fail. A number of years ago, I was a staff pastor in New York City. And one December afternoon, just about this time of the year, it's no more than a week before Christmas, I was out running errands when I received a phone call from a, a dear friend, extended family, a brother in the Lord who also was a law enforcement officer. I, I picked up my phone. I said, hey, brother, what's going on? And this is all he said to me. You better get home as soon as you can. There are sheriff officers at your house. At that time, we were leasing a beautiful cooperative apartment in downtown Brooklyn. We loved the place. Matter of fact, we had spoken to the owner about buying it rather than to continue leasing it. What we didn't know was this, that the owner was pocketing the money that we were giving him and not paying the cooperative that filed for possession of the property, won it. And again, we didn't know anything about that until this particular December afternoon when there was a knock on the door. We knew nothing. And in literally hours, my wife, our baby son, and I, we were homeless. Now, we have friends and, and extended family to support us. I mean, we had somewhere to stay. But I, I wanted, I wanted a safe and comfortable home for my family. I wanted to be back at our residence. I started frantically working to remedy the situation. I explored legal options and I was looking, I mean, diligently looking for a new place to live. After long days of looking at many apartments, I, I'll never forget the words spoken to me by a well-meaning woman. Uh, as I finished my meeting with her, she said something to the fact of, listen, be more than happy to have you uh, take this apartment. You can move in tomorrow. But then as I was walking out the door, I heard her say this, I'm so sorry for your family's situation. It wasn't how she said it, but for some reason, 
the, the gravity of the circumstances hit me like a ton of bricks. And as I stood outside under a starry winter sky, I just started to weep. I felt like a failure. I was a failure as a husband, as a father, as a man. Whatever I had done up to that point as a provider, as head of my household, at that moment didn't seem enough. The next day was a Sunday. As I said, I was a minister. So I had to lead a service and minister as a worshiper of God. Only a few close friends knew our situation, but it was the only thing on my mind. And I was just holding on barely by the strength of a little Jesus. I can tell you now that within 48 hours after that service, a friend who worked for a tenant, landlord, attorney, she was able to retain his services as our representative. Listen to this. He got us onto a judge's docket as the last case before the holiday recess. The court's ruling allowed me to deal directly with the management company. I extended the lease. Matter of fact, the representatives of the management company, after learning of our story, apologized for not reaching out to us, not contacting us before their earlier actions on Christmas Eve. My family and I, we were back home. That Christmas was truly a very special family celebration with service to the community. We were still involved in Christmas outreach. And that evening, we had fellowship with friends. Remembering that Christmas experience, I thought about the original bib biblical narrative and especially Jesus's earthly father, Joseph. And this is what the scriptures tell us about Joseph. Matthew 1, 18 through 24. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph being aroused from sleep did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph was a man of faith. He was compassionate and trustworthy. He was a man who loved God. He loved Mary, and he loved the baby Jesus. So can we imagine how he felt watching Mary give birth to the Son of God in a filthy, smelly 
makeshift shelter that we call a manger. Have you ever visited a farm? Have you ever walked through a barn with animals in it? Have you ever been to a horse's stable? Uh, have you ever had to walk through a chicken coop? And I, I guess there's a pretty good reason there's no air fresheners called stable. No scented candles called barnyard <laughs> chicken coop. <laughs> Is it possible that, Jesus, that uh, Joseph felt a sense of failure? Not good enough to be the father of the most important human being born in the history of mankind. I mean, he did everything God asked of him. He did not put Mary away. He accepted guardianship of Jesus. He married Mary and even vowed not to consummate his marriage until after the birth of Jesus. All that. And now here he is watching his woman give birth in a stable. Is it possible that he felt like the best he could do under the circumstances just wasn't enough? Who knows? Maybe that's why the angels appeared to the shepherds who ran to the manger to confirm the message from God they had received to encourage Joseph. Have you ever felt like you were not enough or that you didn't have enough to meet a need? Does this holiday season feel like you don't have enough to give others? Or to be the family member, the friend, or the good neighbor they need. There's another story in the Bible where Jesus' disciples felt exactly like that. John 6, 5 through 13 says this. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he had already in mind what he was going to do. Now, Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one just to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down about 5,000 men. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. And after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Now, what I find interesting about this story is the fact Jesus knew that he was going to perform this miracle. Yet there was no crisis associated with this miracle. There was no one dying, possessed by demons, needing healing because they were lame, death, or blind. I mean, he could have shared a short devotional teachings and sent the crowd home. But this occasion was designed by Jesus to be a kingdom teaching moment for his disciples, both then and now. A lesson to show them and to show us 
There will be times in life when there will be more demanded than there will be supply. But during these times when disciples may feel like they are not enough or it looks like there's not enough to meet the need, the demand can always be met abundantly. With a little Jesus. I want to share with you four takeaway points from this passage. Number one, Jesus is concerned about both our natural and our spiritual well-being. It tells us that Jesus looked up and he saw the crowd coming toward him and he asked his disciples, how are we going to feed these people? Jesus was thinking, okay, these people are coming out here to hear me. They'll be spending most of the day out here. They're going to be getting hungry. If they're hungry, they can't hear me. You know, there's an old saying, you know, you want to feed people before you share with them so that you keep their growling stomach quiet. People may not care about what you want to share until they know that you care for them. Jesus cares about us. He's our great shepherd. Pastor talked about that last week. He's also our all-sufficient source. Psalm 23, 1 in the Amplified Version says, The Lord is my shepherd to feed, to guide, to shield me. I shall not want. In the NIV, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. And the voice translation says this, the eternal is my shepherd. He cares for me always. Second point, the focus should never be on what we see as the need, but always on the ultimate source. With a recorded number of 5,000 men, biblical scholars tell us that along with women and children. And at that time, they did not count the women and children, but we know that they were there. We were talking about not just 5,000. We were talking about at least maybe 10,000 or more people. Now, the disciples didn't have enough money to feed over 10,000 people. Matter of fact, the small villages surrounding that location didn't have enough food to be sufficient for that crowd. They couldn't even sell. They didn't have the, the quantity of goods to sell to meet that need. However, Jesus wanted to teach that the focus should always be on what God has given you to work with. Is an important lesson. Whatever God gives us is never insufficient. Let me say that again. Whatever God gives us to work with, it is never insufficient. It's just the beginning of what God has planned. Third point, the secret to abundance is a, is a sincere and faith-filled gratitude. Jesus told the disciples, have the people sit down on the grass, and then Jesus took loaves. And he gave thanks and he had his disciples to distribute the foods, the bread and the fish. The masses experienced the benefit of Jesus's prayer of thanksgiving. The disciples witnessed the process of multiplication. That process, vision, faith, Thanksgiving, action, acting on that faith, and rewarded in this situation, feeding the masses. Last point, what wasn't enough at first, Jesus transformed into more than enough. It tells us that 
when everyone had, had their fill. I mean, his food wasn't rationed. They could have as much as they wanted. And you know how people, <laughs> we know how people eat at all you can eat buffets, right? <laughs> and he had the disciples gather what was remaining. He said, let nothing be wasted. How many disciples did Jesus have? In the inner circle, he had what? 12, right? And how many baskets of leftovers did they collect? 12. Some translations say they had big baskets. I mean, they had to have baskets large enough not only to feed themselves, but to feed those who helped them distribute the food. You don't, how, how, you see 12 men feeding 10,000 people. How, how long would that take? Huh. The insufficient five barley, barley loaves and two fishes <laughs> became abundance with the little Jesus. In closing, we know what life is like. Life is a roller coaster. Yes. And I don't know where you are today, but inevitably at some point, you may hear yourself asking questions like, how can I operate in faith when I find myself at a deficit? Or how is it possible to believe I can when the circumstances say you can't? Or what can I do when what's available to work with doesn't look to be enough? As an answer to these questions, I leave you with these words of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. In John 7, 35, Amplified Version, Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never be hungry. And the one who believes in me as Savior will never be thirsty. For that one will be sustained spiritually. Jesus, wait, 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 hold up. You, you calling yourself bread. You're saying, I am bread. I mean, what does that mean? Well, I am refers to Jesus being God. It's an abbreviation for I am that I am, which means I am, I was, and I will be. I am that I am in the Hebrew text is translated into English to mean he who becometh or the becoming one. I will be what I will be or I will become whatsoever I may become. This is how I translate it. I will be whatever is needed for me to be. And when Jesus called himself the bread, people understood the significance of bread in the Old Testament Jewish religious culture. Bread represented survival. It represented necessity of growing grain and food to survive and our hunger, our dependency on the God who creates food. Secondly, bread represented coming together in fellowship and communion. We know that in several places, Jesus is recorded as breaking bread. As believers, we break bread with one another. Sometimes a lot of bread. <laughs> we also break bread with our Lord every time we come together or whenever we take communion. Bread on the altar in the Old Testament was part of the symbols representing covenant between God and his people. God's covenant is the source of our provision. 
Often in this ministry, over the years, we, we bless one another by saying, we are the head and not the tail. We are above and never beneath. And everything that we put our hands to do will prosper and be of good success. Those are covenant promises. Those are ways in which God provides for us. Faith is the means by which we partake or we ingest the bread of life. Now, this faith I'm talking about, it's not our faith. It's not what we believe. It is God's gift of faith that is required for this source of spiritual nourishment. With the bread of life, we will always have and we will always be the manifested provision of God's covenant abundance. Let's remember this. Let's not ever forget this. Thank you, Pastor Mike, for the title of this series. A little Jesus is always more than enough. Merry Christmas. Amen. I'd like to pray as we close today. I'd like to pray two prayers. We talked about this gift of grace. It's a gift from God. It's the grace that enables us to access in greater measure the provision of God into our lives. Listen, God wants to bless us so that we can be a blessing. Amen. That was part of his covenant to Abraham. I will make you the father of many nations and, and your seed will be a blessing. But we can't receive this gift of grace if we haven't received the unspeakable gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's the source. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father. You can't get to what God really has for you except through me. So today, I want to extend two invitations. First, to anyone who's not really certain that they know Jesus. Hey, a lot of us know about Jesus. We, we, we grew up in families that were traditionally Christian. But I'm talking about a living relationship. A relationship that lets you know beyond a shadow of a doubt God knows you're here. God really cares. God knows your name. God knows the number of hairs on your head. And even though you can't see them on my head, God has them numbered. <laughs> if, if you aren't sure, uh, if you've never prayed this prayer, would you join me right now? We're going to all pray this prayer. Say, God in heaven, Father, I thank you for the unspeakable gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, Savior of the world. And I choose to receive that gift today. Jesus, come into my heart. Be Lord of my life. I want to be transformed. I want to know the abundant life that you've promised. I want to be free to serve God. 
Thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. If you prayed that prayer from your heart, even though you were repeating words, that was your prayer. And that's a prayer that God will answer. Anybody who knows that God would answer that prayer, say amen. amen. So if you just prayed that prayer, just do the, could you do this? I'm not going to embarrass you. If you just prayed it, if you're here on, if you're here in the, in the family room, would you just raise a hand? We're not going to embarrass you. Just raise a hand. We just want to be able to. Amen. I see your hand over there. Anyone else? Okay. And I appreciate that acknowledgement. Jesus said, if you acknowledge me publicly, I will acknowledge you before my father. And even if you didn't raise your hand, it's not too late. You can all fill out a welcome card. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. Now, for those who you, you know Jesus, uh, but maybe you feel like you don't know Jesus the way you could know Jesus. That you haven't received the fullness of the gift of grace in operation in you. You receive the gift of grace at salvation. But is it, is it, is it working? Or is it just dormant? Or maybe it's just working, you know, sort of at half capacity. How, how about a gift of an upgrade? <laughs> Of operation. You can't upgrade the gift, but you can operate the operation of the gift within you. Would you pray with me? Or let me pray for you. Father, I thank you even now for your people. God, I thank you for this word. I thank you uh, that you wouldn't speak a word like this to us unless there was something that you want to do in us. So I, I pray for the gift that at this Christmas time, uh, a gift that will transform, that will enable us to walk in a greater fullness of your love, of your light, of your power. That we would in greater measure know your blessing. That you in greater measure will be able to use us as a blessing to others. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray either of those prayers, would you do us a favor? There are welcome cards in the seat pockets in front of you. If you just fill one out, you can put it in the, in the offering basket on your way out. Matter of fact, if you have offerings, the baskets are in the back as we exit. Or you can go to the welcome center in the lobby. Afford us the opportunity not only to know you, but to better serve you, that we might work with, encourage, and grow together in our love and our service of the Lord. God bless you. Let's celebrate Christ. <laughs> and know the joy of this Christmas season. Merry Christmas. Love you. God bless you. <laughs>